It's a great honor to be here among such uh, distinct uh, speakers. And most of them, whether they know it or not, they were mentors to me while I was doing my graduate program. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit about this uh, idea of looking at epilepsy in terms of timing, not exactly in terms of hyperexcitation and inhibition. And um, I would like to start with uh, the physiology behind this. So talk a little bit about uh, how do we code information in the brain? How exactly is information uh, being processed in the central nervous system? Well, historically, what we have is ma major, uh, mainly two kinds of coding. One is the, um, the place coding. And in the place coding, that means that specific areas of the brain would actually encode information. So this is quite noticeable in, in, in Painfield's homunculus. And uh, I'm, I'm, I just put this picture of the auditory system just to differentiate the idea of place coding in auditory signal processing. But uh, specific frequencies would be coded at different regions of the, of the area 42 or, or the auditory cortex, uh, primary cortex. Uh, another way to code information would be the rate coding. The rate coding would be the more, the, the, the higher the frequency of discharge of a specific neuron, the more information, the more is the intense, the, the greater is the intensity of that specific information. So this means that um, if you press the finger of somebody in a, in a, in a, in a sensory uh, receptor, the axon from that sensory receptor would fire at a greater rate depending on how, whether the force that you apply. This is an example right here of, of the visual system in which uh, higher contrast would actually have greater firing, firing rates. Well, uh, around the 90s, actually a little bit before that, and this is a nice revision, uh, review uh, article from Zinger, it, it, the, the concept of phase encoding came to be. And this concept of phase encoding actually showed that you could have endogenous oscillator like gamma oscillations, stat oscillations, medium gamma, high gamma, and specific neurons would actually synchronize to these uh, endogenous oscillators, and that would encode information. So if you look at this article, this is a brilliant article by Frier, Pascal Frier, in, in which he shows an, uh, um, a monkey and has two receptive fields. And the rate of the receptive fields do not change when you present them uh, in, in terms of the, the rate of discharge of the neurons that rep in area V4 that represent those receptive fields. But when the monkey pays attention or drives his attention towards one specific uh, receptive field, the phase of the discharge of that receptive field in area V4 actually starts to synchronize with the gamma oscillations. Oh, this is an interesting aspect in which information we encoded in time, it's kind of a temporal coding, rather than only as a place coding or as uh, uh, a rate coding. So the rate coding would be the same. The rate of discharge of the two receptive fields did not change. And the place coding, well, it's still the same. They're still recording from the same point. So the information conveyed is actually being conveyed by the synchronous, synchronicity of those neurons discharging with the peaks of the gamma oscillations. This is the result that we got, and, and this is what started the whole, uh, the whole idea, is when we applied two different kinds of electrical stimulation to the brain, we had to develop a specific electrode that could be used inside fMRI machines, otherwise you would have a big uh, artifact in the fMRI uh, system. But when we used this, uh, we were able to record bold images blood level oximetry densitometry, so this looks at the area that's been activated when you apply an electrical stimulant to a specific area. In this case, the area that we are choosing to apply this is the amyloid complex, as you can see here and here. If you look at both pictures, the amyloid complex is being recruited the same in this case and in this case. In this case, we applied a four hertz, so these are four stimulus per second in the amyloid complex, but in the top, portion of this figure, this was applied periodically. This means that this was a very constant, fixed, ta, 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 every uh, 250 millisecond uh, uh, discharge pattern. And in the second case, this was a random organ temporal coding. So these were uh, uh, discharges that were completely uh, random. 
still four pulses per second, still the same intensity. So every other parameter of stimulation was maintained constant, but the, 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 the exact timing in which they appeared. And yet, as you can see, there's a huge uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex and uh, nuclear accumbens in this case. We started to look at this in terms of physiology, so we started to see if we could actually, instead of only reading temporal coded information from the brain, if we could write temporal coded to the brain. So this is an uh, interesting experiment in which what we did here is we divided 100 milliseconds into 10 milliseconds bins, which means that we have, if you, if you may, 10 bits. So there are 10 bits. Every single bit represents one moment in time. So uh, we, we have now, from those 10 bits, six ones and four zeros. So there's always six stimuli and, 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 and four blanks. We just reorganize them in two different ra ways. So if you look at the different patterns of organization, I don't know where I'm pointing to, but I guess it would be here and here, you can see that what we have in the first case is uh, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. And in the bottom case, we have one, 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 four zeros, one, one, one. So in, in that 100 millisecond window, all we did is change and, and give the animal two different patterns of stimulation to the basolateral amygdaloid complex. Now we have three groups of animals. The first group of animal, uh, all three groups of animals received both stimuli A and B, both, both kinds of temporal coding, all three groups. In the first group, we never paired a foot shock to any of those two patterns to the amygdaloid complex. And in the second group, we paired only the A pattern to the foot shock. We never paired the B pattern to the foot shock. In the third group, we only paired the B pattern to the foot shock. When we tested these animals for freezing, so this is a typical fear conditioning freezing experiment, but uh, the conditioned stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus that became conditioned stimulus is this, are these patterns applied to the midlight complex? But when it did this, we got an interesting result. So this is uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, no changes between any of the three groups. But as you can see here, when we applied pattern B, only the animal that was conditioned with the pattern B froze. The other, the animals conditioned with A and the other that were not conditioned with any of the stimulus did not freeze. 48 hours after that, we retested all the animals now using pattern A. Only the animals with pattern A that were uh, uh, paired during training actually froze. The other animals did not freeze. We did that again 72 hours after uh, the conditioning, and it reverted again. Well, now this result shows that the animal is actually able to interpret and to recognize these temporal patterns when you apply them to the brain. So it seems to work not only when you read, but when you write. So this is kind of an, uh, a synchronous serial communication to the rat brain. So this is actually a USB communicating to a specific area. We can convey different information even if we use the same rate at the same place just by changing the timing. The interesting thing is that after that we did a CFOS. This is a triple labeling of CFOS, NUN, and uh, DAP. And what we saw here is in this figure, of course, th this is ipsilateral and to the basal amygdaloid complex, exactly where we apply the stimulus. Uh, just remember the stimulus here is quite small. We use 25 microamps. This is a micro stimulation. So this is a very localized stimuli. Uh, but even though you recruit in this specifically the amygdaloid co complex close to the electrode. But contralaterally, in the other side, no, the B pattern gets uh, higher labeling than the other two. If you look at the uh, hypothalamus and the uh, amygdaloid complex, you see similar results. So the pattern that was uh, uh, paired to the foot shock actually is the one that gets higher results in both uh, uh, B, when you present the B complex. You get a different situation for the prefrontal cortex. In the prefrontal cortex, it seems like, oh, I, I, I don't really recognize what this pattern is, so we better find out what it is, and that's the role that the prefrontal cortex plays on this. Well, we were very excited about these results, and then we try to apply this when things don't go the way we sh they should, so when things go wrong. In this case, we were looking at how this temporal coding could actually work in terms of other diseases. 
for example, and we were not the first ones to look at this, this is a typical example of schizophrenia patients in which they applied this test. This is a quite well-known test, uh, the Mooney test, in which they show these faces that are only black and white. And kids, very young children, do not recognize them as faces. And if you look at the EEG of uh, a specific control patient, this is bef before you present the faces, and this is after, these lines show areas of the brain that start to phase lock with each other. So they start to have very fixed phase differences between them. So this is normal, but this is what happens in a patient with schizophrenia. It has a lot of trouble trying to phase lock these, these areas. The energy of specific bandwidths of the EEG, no, these don't seem to be altered. But the time phase, the time locking between them, well, that seems to be a big problem. And the, the, this paper actually proposes a diagnostic tool. This is the difference between the two groups. Well, what about, now, what about if we use this idea of temporal coding to try to uh, see if we can, we can help patients with epilepsy? And uh, the problem with epilepsy, and this is a, a pictorial uh, graph from William Leno, from the Leno Gasto uh, 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 syndrome. And, and, and this is, he, he depicts this as two major factors. One, f some fundamental factors that, are the, 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 that makes the, the, the patient prone to having seizures, and some contributing factors that actually may induce seizures every now and then. And, this, and then he presented this as a reservoir that would reach a level until it, bro it would break this dam and the water would fall and, and seizure would befall on the patient. So this was mainly an idea of an equilibrium between excitation and inhibition. And the concept is, if you're excited too much and you do not compensate with proper inhibition, you would have a seizure. Well, and I'm quoting one of the speakers here, this, is, this has been shown to be true in several cases, and especially because one of the concepts here is that the concepts of, of excitation, it, it, when it gets too excited, hyper-excitation, they're quite entwined with the concept of synchronicity. And I, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what EEG is, just to make this clear for, for those who not, uh, are familiar with electrophysiology. You can imagine EEG as if uh, this room was filled with, uh, we were in a lake with a little bit of water, and every drop would generate a wave. And those waves that you see are the propagation of these electric fields in the conducting volume, which is the brain. So, uh, in terms of scalp electrodes, uh, if you get too far away from where the electrodes are positioned, those waves are going to get so small, so small, because you're going to decay with the square of the distance that you're not going to see anything. So you have to be a little bit close where it happens. But can you imagine a buoy positioned somewhere in a rainy day like this? You would see this buoy moving really fast. Well, that's kind of the better rhythm that you get in EEG, normal EEG. So the buoy keeps moving up and down really fast. If a specific rhythm, so imagine what would happen if all these drops would, would stop and then fall, all of them at the same time. Oh, this buoy would move really high. It would synchronize and move high. So the amplitude of the stimuli would kind of be related to the capacity of specific neural populations to synchronize and thus make bigger waves so we can see it from a far away distance. Well, uh, so th this is what makes the concept a little bit entwined between them. Actually, e even in, in, in papers where uh, we look at uh, neural modeling of, of uh, modeling of neural networks, this is true. If you give in a specific neural network an increase on the excitatory input without making proper inhibitory compensation, the circuit tends to synchronize neural populations. That actually happens. So the concept of these two things were entwined. And, and, and here is just to show that for several reasons, uh, we, we are probably talking about uh, the difficulty in seeing th this in a very slow phase encoding temporal scale, is that uh, you, you only see big changes in the EEG when we're looking at excitatory and, and synchronous discharges of, of neural populations. Of course, this is a th rule of thumb, has to be dealt with a lot of caution, especially now that we have electrodes that can record multi-unit, multi-electrode recordings. So th th there's a lot of, of, of gaps in this, in this uh, affirmative. But in, in general, the, the EEG would be excitatory, post, uh, post synaptic synaptic 
uh, uh, potentials. And, and uh, uh, if you look at this table, it just shows that if you open up a chloride channel, you would not make a big wave outside of the neuron because the, the Nernst equation for the chloride is quite close to the resting potential membrane uh, potential, so you would not have a big wave in, in, in the extracellular space. You would not have a big change in the electric field distribution of extracellular space. Well, so where does that leave us? How you could entwine both concepts? Again, we borrowed this from literature because people have done some amazing work with this, and this is a review from Jeffries. And, uh, and actually, this is it's a graph from uh, uh, Lopez da Silva showing that quite possibly what we do have is not one huge epileptic, one epileptic foci that just keeps spreading excessively because of the incapacity of buffering pota excessively potassium or by aphatic transmission or by volume conduction or whatever that would keep on increasing until it recruits a larger neural population. But what you could have is some several epileptic micro domains, micro seizure domains. And what would happen is that you would make them uh, uh, hyper excitable by increasing the connectivity, making abnormal connectivity between these micro domains. One of the candidates of these microdomains would be HFOs. We're going to have a marvelous lecture about this with, uh, with Mark Cunningham. And uh, these are several of the ideas of things that could actually connect some of these groupings or some of these micro seizure domains. And, and as they merge, they would actually become a full scale seizure. Again, this concept in physiology, the binding visual t theory that Zinger proposed for uh, visual percepts, it's not new in, in physiology, but it's, it's quite a new concept for epileptology. If you look at, at the synchronization, this is also uh, a question under a lot of debate. Uh, lots of, uh, th there, are, th there, are, uh, there is evidence uh, in literature to suggest that sometimes uh, there, these microdomains have to get really hyper-excitable, but not synchronized before the seizure. So you see a lack of synchronization just before the seizure, and as they get connected, then you see a synchronization that, that, uh, that relates to the seizure. This is a typical example of what this is. It's, it's, it, they got the principal component analysis of a specific uh, uh, contributor, and look at the, uh, the component one and two. As you can see, it seems like you have an attractor fighting with each other. So this is, would be the sign of a, one of the attractors. This would be for the other one. And when this attractor wins this fight and synchronizes everything with him, then you have a full-scale seizure. How can we use electrical stimulation to try to avoid this abnormal uh, synchronization? So uh, the main idea here is, uh, if I know where the microdomains are, well, find it and silence it. Take it off. I mean, just, just go in and, 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 and remove it surgically or uh, use drugs to silence it. And the problem is when these microdomains are too distributed and, and you can, cannot find a proper foci. The, the whole idea of, of uh, localized seizures and, and spreaded seizures, like generalized seizures or focal seizures, this is also a concept it's a complicated concept. There are several people that, have, that are being diagnosed with focal seizures that when you look closely, they look more like generalized seizure and generalized seizures that actually look like specific microdomain foci that get connected together. But anyway, one of the ideas would be to block, block all of them. And, and most of these uh, uh, stimulations and, 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 drug and, and drug use and therapy use that. This is a paper that we published just showing that sometimes you can have an, a drug on demand. So instead, this is a cannabinoid agonist that we used. And if you use a CB1 agonist, it actually makes seizure worse. But if you inhibit the hydrolysis of specific endocannabinoids like anandamide, then it works pretty good as an anticonvulsant. This means that somehow the seizure recruits the circuit as a feedback mechanism. So if you act on the enzyme that breaks an endomid, this would be a, 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 pharmac a, a pharmacological uh, approach that would act on a circuit on demand. So this would be a, a quite interesting uh, different approach in terms of the pharmacology to treat epilepsy. Anyway, in electrical stimulation, it seems quite controversial that we would use something that excites the brain to inhibit it. So uh, the main idea of high-frequency stimulation is that uh, this would uh, uh, block specific areas, just like you do in, in ablative surgery, for example, remove it, 
because it would, uh, uh, the HF would, would, would cause a depolarization blockage or a synaptic inhibition or a synaptic depression or uh, some kind of, of putting that area in a refractory period so it would not be able to activate. So it would work, the high frequency stimulation, as if you were dynamically removing that component from the epileptogenic circuit. The low frequency stimulation, on the other hand, would actually excite some of these uh, substrates. And by exciting them, if you excite a substrate that actually is part of a feedback mechanism that would inhibit the oscillatory epileptogenic neural network, it would work as an anticonvulsant uh, uh, a stimulus. So this would be the, the conventional way, and I'm, I'm being quite simplistic here, I'm sorry for that, just I have only 30 minutes, uh, to, to, to symbolize HF and LF stimulations. But if you apply, so this is a, a, a work done by TAS, brilliant work by TAS, and, and, and what he shows here is if you apply stimulation to different areas of a specific neural modeling network, what you could do is even if you excite this, but you excite different areas out of phase, you could actually disrupt the epileptogenic process and you would stop seizures. So what we try to do here is instead of using this in this idea that you would excite different places at different times, well, let's use our temporal coding stimulation. So this, this work was done by uh, Vinicius. Uh, Vinicius is a professor at uh, Universidade Federal de uh, São João del Rey. He runs a, a, a group now uh, that's called Links. And uh, um, we used four patterns. This is a periodic pattern. So as you see, all, the, the, all four pulses per second, this, 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 and this, all, all A, B, and C, all, all these uh, patterns of simulation, they're all four hertz. But if you look at the first one, they're periodically spaced. The second one is a control group. The control group is just to make sure that we are not deleting that area by doing high frequency stimulation. We concentrated all four pulses in the beginning of, the, of each second. By concentrating this, this is a 100 hertz stimulation applied at the beginning of each second. This is a, a mixed, a, a random distribution of the four pulses. But this does not obey any uh, restraint in terms of how long it would take from the f between the first pulse and the last pulse, which means to say that here I'm not worried about having a steady state response. Uh, it does not consider the whole thing as one word. So in this case, yeah, in this case here, we have a, a proper word. I mean, when I do the first stimulation and, and when I get to the last one, the first one is still doing its effect on the network when the, neck, the, the, the last one pumps in. So this means that all of the four stimuli may be considered like a, a coded word. Well, when we did this, this was published on in, in epilepsy and behavior, uh, the periodic stimulation made seizures worse. I mean, I, lead, I needed less PTZ to induce the seizures in, in these animals. The, the controls did not change significantly from uh, the non-stimulated animals, but this was the non-periodic stimulation, and this uh, it increased significantly the amount of drug that I needed to induce seizures. So this was anticonvulsant, proconvulsant. This was anticonvulsant, and, and this is the generalized tonic-clonic seizure. These are the, the first uh, 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 four limb clonus that we see in a typical PTZ seizure. So what this shows is that by changing the temporal code you might either be pro or anticonvulsant just because in this case we expected to uh, desynchronize the networks and in this case we expected to synchronize uh, the networks. After we published this, uh, we saw in literature, this is a uh, paper from Kinkard, uh, Anne Kinkard, and uh, uh, what she did here is she used these different simulations, patterns of simulations to look at arousal of the brain and she saw clear differences between uh, both EEG uh, energy bands and behavior in, uh, uh, when she applied either periodic stimulation or different time patterns of stimulation. Uh, another work that, that actually started to, to consider this as a, a, therapeutic, a, a possible therapeutic approach was the design of a new stimulator that would take into account the possibility of designing temporally coded electrical stimulation. So this work actually, uh, they, they probably like what they read from our work. So, 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 so they built this uh, to, to be able to do temporally coded simulations. Uh, quite important is to say that this only works in specific areas of the brain, specific uh, areas of the temporal lobe that are quite polymodal and um, 
quite complex in terms of their uh, internal structure and neural network. Because if you do this in the thalamus, uh, we, the, the thalamus does not distinguish uh, uh, the, between the temporal coding. And, and, and just to be clear here, because of the marvelous presentation Dr. Bertrand gave uh, in this morning, this is the anterior thalamus. So we are a little bit far, uh, too far away, but from the medial thalamus, but this is the anterior portion of, of the thalamus. As you can see, independently of being periodic or non-periodic, this had an anticonvulsant effect. If you look at the fMRI, of these animals, you can see that uh, in the fMRI, this is um, um, uh, the, the, a normal, P, how, how the brain looks throughout a normal PTZ seizure. So you can see both sides of the brain are recruited, so it's bilateral. In the bottom figure, you see that it's a periodic stimulation. Uh, the, the, the position in which the electrode is placed, I have no idea where I'm pointing at, oh, this is it. So if you look at this, uh, the, the side ipsilateral to the stimulation is highly uh, uh, activated. And then in the non-periodic, the side of the electrode is actually deactivated and only the contralateral side is activated. Well, but here's the problem. Once the seizure starts, well, what, what it seems to, to, to do is it, the damage is done already. So how can we predict, predict that these hyperconnectivities are happening and be able to act upon it to stop them before they actually get uh, 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 hyperconnected and, and actually get all these micro seizure domains to get firing at synchronicity and develop a full scale seizure. We got an idea of probing the circuit and looking for phase locking from a work from uh, uh, Dr. Kalitzin and Dr. Lopes da Silva in which they had this phase coherence system. And, and what they did here it showed that just before uh, a seizure was about to happen, if they applied a specific uh, electrical simulation pattern, they used here 20 hertz of stimulation and bursts, and looked at what happened to the EEG after that, it would really phase lock. Actually, they published the work after this uh, to show that uh, um, uh, patients with the uh, with a tendency to have uh, 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 reflex epilepsy from visual stimulation would actually have a higher phase locking than patients that were non-epileptic. So what we tried to do here, and this is the work of Danielle, is to try to use a specific very low frequency. This is a 0.5 hertz. This is one stimuli every two seconds to see if we could phase lock uh, a specific pre-ictal discharges and by looking at that phase locking, if we could predict that a seizure was, was, going, was about to happen. And by doing that, then we would come in with a closed looping solution with the non-periodic simulation. So uh, just to, to show that these uh, uh, seizures, uh, the, 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 this kind of point hertz uh, uh, stimulation did not change the, the seizure itself. It, you see that the time it took for the seizure to happen doesn't change, and neither the duration of the seizure, neither the spectral analysis of the seizure itself, of the, of the ictal episode itself. It did change significantly the areas of the brain recruited. This is a CFOS expression of that. And most of all, it changed significantly the synchronicity of pre interictal discharges uh, when you use that were driven by our point hertz stimuli. This can better be seen in this figure. This figure, this is the normal EEG. This top is the EEG of an animal having a seizure, but with no electrical stimulation. So you see the, all the interictal discharges uh, dancing about this uh, two second window. But in this case, you see that all of these tend to synchronize and discharge at an exact frequent, uh, an exact timing after the stimuli. This can also be seen with this uh, independent component analysis that we did. So what this is, is this is showing just a little portion of the EEG that, that's being cut in two second intervals. And as you can see, what we did is we got the computer to recognize specific parts of waves, of independent component analysis, and, and show us in this graph when they happened. And as you can see, it's a, it's a big mess, uh, even uh, that only changes when the animal seizes. So this, right up here is when the seizure starts. But if you look closely to the bottom graph, you see that these patterns tend to align at this point. The, the, all this is happening only at the, the, the gray area from this graph. 
So this is the gray area expanded. As you can see, all the waves happen at any time, and then just before the seizure, they synchronize and maintain themselves synchronized until the seizure starts at T0. So th at this time, this would give us enough time to come in with a non-periodic stimulation and try to get this to look like this, and thus inhibiting seizures. Uh, my time's up. Thank you very much. This is the, 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 the people that work in this. I'm actually highlighting some of them here that, um, that are at the Congress. So they are the ones in, 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 in green. Thank you very much.